Johnny, let's begin the way we do with everyone, with your name and nationality. My name is Johnny Incapié, and I am from Medellín, Colombia. Johnny, I know you were born in Colombia, and you came to the States, and eventually you went back, but returned pretty quickly. So most of your, most of your childhood memories are of your time in New York. Talk to me about what life was like growing up in Queens. Um, well, I used to live in Bay Terrace, Queens, so it was a predominantly uh, Irish, Italian, Jewish neighborhood, and I would, my family and I were like the only Colombians in that neighborhood at the time. But it was a residential neighborhood. And it was a quiet neighborhood, and uh, going to school over there was different from going to school or being raised in other neighborhoods in New York City. Um, the 80s was a um, memorable era for me because New York City at the time wasn't the best um, place to walk around and even to take a subway. Uh, crime rate was very high, especially due to the crack epidemic. Uh, but nonetheless, um, I was raised with the moral values that my family instilled in me and my younger brother that we had to work hard to gain anything that we wanted to achieve. And that was if we were gonna graduate from high school and we were gonna receive a car or vacation or a high school graduation party, that was the whole objective that we were going to look forward to with life as well. Whatever profession or career that I was going to choose, I had to work hard in order to receive those rewards. So my family made it very clear that life wasn't gonna be easy and nothing was gonna be handed to us, but they were very supportive of us and they made sure that we understood that. Right. And what did your parents do for a living professionally? Uh, my mother was an interior designer and my father, he uh, had a, a office with a travel agency in real estate. Mm -hmm. And your home life, what was that like? My home life, uh, me and my younger brother, uh, going to school, um, playing video games, playing basketball, baseball. I was a huge baseball and soccer uh, f fanatic, so um, I grew up uh, playing that a lot in the summertime. And in the wintertime, you know, in wintertime, I didn't like the cold at all. As much as I love New York, I didn't like the cold at all. So. Um, I used to go out just to shovel snow to try to make money off of that. But other than that, I used to stay inside. Right. I understand music was an important thing for you growing up. Yes, it was. Um, growing up in New York, I discovered what it was to be a b-boy. And I became a b-boy. And that, <laughs> that was a big thing back then. That was a big thing. And so back in 1984, uh, when breakdancing was at its peak in all of the United States, and it was very, very big in New York City, I learned how to break dance. And I remember me, my brother, and my friends in front of our garage with a cardboard box, uh, doing the backspin, trying to do the windmill, you know, popping and everything. So I grew up as a, as a dancer, but um, as I became older as a teenager, I got into DJing and I first uh, landed a job at a teen nightclub as a teen promoter, <laughs> which was the weirdest thing. My parents only allowed me to go there like once a month, but eventually um, I started to be good at it and uh, got to get other jobs in other different nightclubs around New York City. And at the end of the day, I just wanted it to make it in the industry, in the entertainment industry. You saw that as a, as a viable option for you professionally? Yeah, because growing up, uh, my father always wanted to be a movie actor. He came to the United States because he wanted to be an actor and he never got to fulfill that dream. Uh -huh. And uh, I think it was embedded in me. Uh -huh. So I had other uh, goals of like being a businessman or, or a doctor, but definitely I wanted to be an actor. And 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 working in, in the music industry, working in that, in, in that entertainment industry, being a DJ, a dancer, and, and meeting so many other celebrities at that time, which was for me, freestyle music, house music. Um, I said, you know, I looked at myself as being the male version of J-Lo. <laughs> that's because that's, that's, how, that's how J-Lo... That's how she popped off, had, yeah. That's how she made herself successful. She was a dancer in living color. And next thing you know, she's an actress, she's a dancer, she's making music. And, that, and I didn't know J-Lo at the time. I didn't know who she was. But in hindsight, that's 
how I wanted to make my living. That's yeah. how I was trying to uh, get known and be successful, and I never did. S sounds to me like you had a pretty fun gig in high school. If you were a teen promoter, you were basically hustling your friends to come out to the nightclubs and come party with you. That's what it sounds like. Um, Which is a pretty good gig for a high school kid. Yeah, yes and no, because the high school that I went to um, in Bayside, I went to Bayside High School. So it's like not everybody was used to going out to clubs or anything like that. Every, you know, every, everybody was used to doing something different. Right. Um, and for the most part, a lot of my friends in Bay Terrace at that time were very, very focused on college. And so was I. Mm -hmm. um, I applied to go to St. John's University. Never made it because of what happened to yeah. me. But um, so another portion of my friends, they were into going out to clubs and they liked that lifestyle. But I never saw myself as staying working in clubs. So I, I don't want to be misconstrued in saying that I wanted a lifestyle of just working in clubs the, my whole entire life. I was just trying to meet people and trying to see if there was something that they saw because I was offering myself in so many different ways of how I can move up the ladder. So yes, I mean, that was that was a thing back then. That was a popular, you know, if you were working at a nightclub, if you had access to, you know, bringing people into a club or promoting a club, that was... Uh, that was basically being the high school quarterback back then. Yeah, and um, I used to like going to clubs and I couldn't help it. I'm right. not going to lie. I couldn't help it. Uh, I was into the music and because, like I said, I grew up as a break dancer. I used to love dancing and, and the house music was already popular at that right. time. So if you're a promoter at a teen night, you know, and you're not going to be just standing around. You already did what you had to do to get everybody inside the club. So... I used to dance and have fun and then go home. So, um, yeah, it, it, was a, it was a pretty bit exciting. Right. I'm yeah. sure it was. I'm sure it was. Now, as I understand, and correct me if I'm wrong, there was a, uh, a DJ that you knew or at least knew of that on a fateful September 3rd, 1990, was throwing a party at Roseland, if I'm not mistaken. Correct. Um, Walk me through how that impacted what happened that night. Okay, so DJ was a very popular DJ at the time. His name was John Gungi Rivera. He used to DJ in a lot of uh, clubs in New York City. The most DJs that were known back then were um, Little Louis Vega, uh, um, Ricardo, Roman Ricardo. And those John, guys are all still household names. Yeah, yeah. All these years later, those names still... Exactly. Yeah. So he was uh, having his birthday bash at Roseland. And a lot of my friends were like, hey, listen, we're going to Roseland. Why don't you come out with us? And it just happened to be like at that moment between the summer, uh, between July and, and September, I was already like really focusing on college. I was making a lot of changes in my life. So although I was doing my promoting in the clubs, I said, you know what, uh, September's coming around, uh, I got to get my act together. And a lot of my friends hadn't seen me in a while. So I said, why don't you come out with us? I was like, okay, you know, I'll go out with you guys. What I didn't know is that there were so many other people that they invited and a lot of people that I did not know because it was like, you invite your friends and I don't know your friends and your friends invited some other friends and I don't know them either. So at the end of the night, there were a bunch of people that didn't know each other. So it wasn't just your crew of guys that you hung out with. This thing was just growing exponentially. Exactly. And you guys decide to meet up where? So we decided to meet up at the train station in Queens. And uh, we... Which, well, I'm sorry, which, which train station? Um, 74th Street and Roseville Avenue. Okay, so you guys meet up there what time? I say More or less, a, early in the day, midday? No, it was in, it was in the evening. I would say somewhere, I, I don't remember exactly, about 8 or 9 o'clock, somewhere around okay, there. Okay, so it's later at night. Yeah. And you're looking at a crew of how many guys show up to this place? Oh, when I got to the train station, because I had to take the bus from Bay Terrace to take the train in Main Street Flush in the 7 train to then transfer to the train in 74th Street to meet them. 
So I had a, I had a train ride because I, I, I didn't live where everybody else lived. Right. So when I met them, there was like about 30, 40, 50 people there. And you knew how many of these guys? I knew a good 12, 13. So you knew a <laughs> It's because there was a few guys and girls. Right, yeah. right, right. And what was the atmosphere with this crew when, once you showed up? Everybody was positive. Everybody was lively, you know. Um, everybody was just like, hey, what's going on? Um, Didn't seem to be out of hand. No, no, no. Cool. Everybody was basically with their own people that they knew. Um, nobody really went out their way to introduce everybody. But um, some people were introduced and then that was it. Everybody just said, okay, let's go. Right, right. So what happened? You show up, you meet up with your with your friends. So I meet up with them. I uh, was on the train with these other girls that I knew. So they came along with me because I met up with them in Flushing. And then we went and met with the other individuals in 74th Street. And we transferred to take the E train downstairs. And uh, we went to Manhattan. And um, everybody got like on different subway cars. On, on the subway, mm -hmm. and I was with the girls. And when we got out, I went outside. When we, we got out at uh, 53rd and 7th Avenue, and um, we went, everybody just got outside to the, uh, the sidewalk, the street level, and everybody was just standing there. And um, I had these specific jeans that I had just bought. I thought they were the coolest, the, 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 the like greatest jeans that I saw in the village by West 8th Street. There was this uh, thrift shop and I just never seen jeans like these. So they had a bunch of, of, uh, of pockets, but they had no seams in them. So you can try to put your hands in there, but they weren't going in. So it was like front and back all on um, down towards my feet, up to here, and it was just cool. So I had my wallet in my um, in my socks. So you had a pants filled with pockets, but nothing could go into any of the exactly. pockets. Exactly. And I was and I was and I had my wallet in my socks, and I knew that um, my friend who I made plans with that went out with us that night, I saw him that he came with a fanny pack. So um, prior. To go to getting out to Manhattan, mm -hmm. I gave him my wallet, and he put it in his fanny pack. Cause I asked him, "Can you hold it for me?" Cause right. I knew I was gonna be dancing that night. Right. I knew as much as I loved dancing, I was gonna be dancing, and there was no way that I was gonna keep my wallet in my um, sock because I knew from past experiences my wallet came out of my sock. Right. So he said, "Sure, no problem. I'll hold it in my fanny pack." So when we got to um, the street level, I was looking for him because I needed my wallet to get inside the club. Right. There's no way I can get in if I don't pay. Right. And he's not outside. So I'm asking around. I'm saying, uh, do you see Anthony? His name is Anthony. He says, I think he never came out of the subway. So I said, okay. Um, so I told the people um, that they were, that already started to leave to go, to go to the club. I said, just go over there, get online, and hold me a spot. So I went back downstairs inside the subway, and I saw another friend. And he was just hanging out by the turnstiles, not past the turnstile, but before you go through them. Right. And he said he was waiting for somebody. But at the same time, he was flirting with some girls. So while I was talking to him, I got involved with him to flirt with these with the girls too. How many girls were there? It was two girls. So we started flirting with the girls and um, I just got caught up in the conversation. I said, you know what? I need to look for my friend. I was going to go downstairs past the turnstile. I said, no, what? you know what? Let me um, go back upstairs, but I didn't. So I decided to go downstairs and I took the, um, the, um, what did it? Took the escalator? The escalator. The I took uh -huh. the escalator and I never made it downstairs because as, as I started to go down the escalators, I heard a bunch of people screaming and running towards me. So there was no way I could get through them because there was so many of them. So I just turned around and started running as well. And what went through your head as you're going down and you hear this commotion and people are coming up the stairs? What did you think? There was there was a few things. Actually, I wasn't sure. I didn't know. But I said somebody probably got into a fight. There was a, a subway that crashed. Uh, there was a fire or the shooting. I didn't know what. Right. Just some bad news. I got to exactly. get out of here. Yeah. So I just went upstairs, 
went out to the street level and then I went into Ro I went to Roseland and I met up with um, the girls who were online. So you saw the girls again online at Roseland? Yeah, and I got online with them. Approximately, I would say maybe four, five, six, seven minutes later, the peep, there were the, another group of individuals that went out with us on the subway. They came, and my friend who was holding my wallet, he was with them. And he, we're like asking each other, hey, well, where are you? I was looking for you. You were looking for me. He gives me my wallet. We both go to Roseland. We both meet up with the girls. And when you're outside, I'm sorry, when you run into Anthony, nobody made mention of what had happened downstairs? Why people well, the were rest exiting. of the people that were coming out, I didn't know them. You understand? So it's not like people were stopping and saying, hey, this was going on, or people were going up to other people. People were just like trying to mind their business. And that's how New York City was back in the days. So people got out. He was there. He said, what's going on? I said, I don't know. People are just coming out and I'm leaving too because I came here looking for you. But because you're out here, I don't need to go back inside. That's right. the bottom line. So we went to Roseland. I got online. And a few minutes later, the other individuals that were, went out with us that night, they came and they got online as well. So throughout that whole time, nobody had any idea of what took place. And when you say the other individuals that came out with us that night, were those the, were, 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 were those the kids responsible for the murder of uh, yes. Brian Watkins? Yes. Yes. Wow. So the other group... So what was actually happening downstairs as you're upstairs flirting with the girls? As I understand it, they were, they were short of cash. They were looking to make some money to go party at Roseland with the rest of the crowd that night. And they wanted to mug this family, right? Exactly. So... I told you everything that I just said to you to get to the point that it wasn't until after I got arrested, okay, that detectives came to my home and dragged me to the police station. But before we get there, we'll get, right. we'll get to that in a second. We'll get to that in a second. I know, and I know in your timeline, you didn't know what was going on, but you know what happened now in Correct. retrospect. So while you're flirting with these girls, who are the guys that are downstairs mugging this family? There's, a, there's approximately seven to eight individuals downstairs or more um, that decided to mug a family from U uh, Utah. They were tourists. They were a Mormon family, and they were visiting New York City to attend the U.S. Open Tennis Tournament. And they decided to go out the night uh, to the village in New York City just to go to eat at a restaurant. And unfortunately, they never made it to the restaurant because some of those individuals that went out with us that night didn't have enough money to get inside of Roseland. And one individual supposedly accidentally stabbed the son of the family in, uh, with a butterfly knife. And his knife only went into a quarter of an inch of an artery in his chest. And he died uh, on his way to the hospital. And the reason he was stabbed, as I understand, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, apparently they accosted the mother. And this was a 20-year-old kid who sort of jumped in front of his mother to make sure she wouldn't get hurt. And that wound up costing him his life, no? Uh, according to the reports of, of how everything happened, of what was said, right. that's, that's basically right. what they said, that right. he was coming to um, save his mother, help his mother, Whatever the situation was, which was a sad situation. Oh, it was a horrible yeah. situation. Yeah. And this happened how long after the Central Park jogger case? So, because I think that was also yes. part and parcel of yes the reason you wound up getting railroaded. Yes, because the Central Park jogger case was one year before my case. One year, so this was still fresh in the minds of everybody. Very fresh in New York. This was, and and that story intersects with yours via a detective. But we're going to get to that in a little bit. You see, I've done my homework. So, uh, so, so that's what's going on on that platform. That's the reason why everybody runs up the stairs completely unbeknownst to you. You're trying to get a date with one of the two girls and your buddies upstairs in your fancy pants full of pockets that you can't use, and these guys are killing someone downstairs. Yeah, they're, they're, they're robbing somebody, so, yeah. Were these guys members of your crew or were they part of an extended crew? Well, I knew I knew a few of the guys there. Not all of them. I didn't know all of them. I, in fact, one of the guys that were arrested that night, I met him that night. I never knew him in my life. And he became my co-defendant for the next 25 years. Wow. Wow. So you, so you make it into Roseland 
any mention of what had happened? Did anyone no. bring it up? No. And the guys that had perpetrated that crime, they're partying in Roseland that night? Yes. Wow. Yes. Uh, but I believe, uh, according to trial minutes and everything, mm-hmm. and what happened at the hearing, there was one or two of the individuals that ne- they never made it inside because they were lingering outside the club or something, and they were immediately identified. Mm. Yeah. Wow. So you party that night, you have a good time, you head home. Uh, I don't want to get ahead of the story, but how much time before you get a knock on the door? So I go home and I'm there with my mother, my girlfriend, and later that night around, say, 8 o'clock, 7.30, 8 o'clock or some detectives come to my home. The following night? Yes. The following night? Yes. So before that, no idea what no, had happened. Nothing whatsoever. None. Did you hear the news that someone had yes. been? Yes. So I saw the news of my girlfriend. And me and my girlfriend was like, oh, my God, there's such and such on TV being arrested and taken into a, 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 a car. He was placed inside a car. And that's when we found out, hey, you know, there was a, a robbery that had taken place in the subway. So now I'm starting to, like, connect the dots here. Because they're talking about Roseland. I see one of the people that I know that went out with us that night. Right. And I was like, oh, my God, this is crazy, you know. Um, thank God I never went downstairs. I'm telling my girlfriend. And I started explaining to her everything that just happened because she had just came back from Florida. The first person she was going to see was me. I'm right. her boyfriend at the right. time, you know. Right. Right. So she was like, oh, my God, what's going on? So you're as shocked by this as yeah. anybody else. But I didn't think anything of it. You know, so I just continued to be in the house with my girlfriend, my mother. I'm eating, me and my girlfriend, um, I was going to take her back home. Next thing you know, um, the police came to my house. Detectives came to my house. Um, They literally, literally just like barged in, you know. They didn't even ask my mother permission or anything like that. And my mother um, really, really didn't know anything about the law. And neither did I. I never had a criminal record, never been arrested or anything like that. So she was like, sure, you know, and oh, you had nothing to hide. Exactly. And we were taught, OK, to always be respectful toward authority. Right. You know, so we were like my mother wanted to answer their questions. She says, not a problem. And they asked her, does your son live here? Do you have a son named Johnny? I said, sure. And she called me. I came downstairs with my girlfriend and they asked me, says, um, you need to come. No, they asked me, did you go out last night? He says, yes, I did. And my mother was like, why? What happened? What's going on? And says, oh, no, we, um, we're investigating a, a crime that your son probably knows about a stolen car. That's what they said. I said, a stolen car? I don't know about a no stolen car. And then all of a sudden, one of the detectives just cut to the chase. He says, did you go to Roseland? I said, yeah, I went to Roseland. And he um, says, uh, well, do you know or anything that happened? It says, no, nothing at all. I just saw something about Roseland on the news, but I don't know anything at all. And um, next thing you know, he says, well, you need to come with us. My mother's like, can I go with him? And she was, they were like, well, how old is your son? And she said, 18. He says, well, no, you don't need to go with him. He's old enough. He needs to come with us. And you had turned 18 shortly I, before Yeah, that, I had no? just turned 18. I was like three months into being 18 well, years old. you were a kid. Yeah. 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 So um, they dragged me out of my house. Mm-hmm. Both of them grabbed me one by one arm, the other one by the other arm. And my mother was trying to call a lawyer, but she didn't know that because she paid, she didn't get to pay her phone bill on time, right? They weren't allowing her to make phone calls that were going out the house, but we were allowed to receive phone calls coming into the house. So... So she couldn't reach anyone. She couldn't reach anyone, and they didn't let her come with me. So these guys drag you, they put you in a in a squad car. And take me to uh, Midtown North Precinct in Manhattan. So you're not taking somewhere in Queens, you're taking directly to Manhattan. No. They did try to look for somebody else. They were looking for somebody else. Uh, they stopped in an area of Queens, and after they couldn't find somebody, they took me to Manhattan. Yeah. And what happened? What what went down once you arrived at the, at the station? Well... There was reporters, media all over the place, and one of the detectives told me that he was going to put um, one of his jackets over my head so the media wouldn't see my face. And as soon as I came out of the car, they handcuffed me. And they put my hands behind my back, and they handcuffed me, and they dragged me inside the precinct. And all I heard throughout 
the way was a lot of people talking, yelling, like, who is that? Who is he? And you hear a lot of cameras being snapped and shots taken. And once I was inside the prison, they took the jacket off me. Uh, they had me stand there for a little moment. And then they took me into a room. And um, there was a detective there. And he asked the detective, where do you want him to be seated? And the detective told him, tell him um, seat him over there. There was a table towards the back with a chair. And he sat me right there. And throughout the whole time, he kept me handcuffed. So during this whole process, at what point does it sink in that this is a serious situation for you? Well, the moment that the detectives asked me, asked my mother that they wanted uh, me to go with them, I had like ambiguous feelings because I was like, well, I got no problem going with them because if they like trying for me to help out with what took place in Rose Line, because if I knew any of the guys, especially being that I saw one of the guys on TV, I have no problem helping out, telling them what I did or what I know. So but, as far as you leaving the house and going into the police car, at that point, you're thinking, I'm here to help these guys out and tell them what I know. Yeah. At what point did you figure this is not what this is about? When they put the handcuffs on me to go inside the precinct. That was the, that was uh, the moment for you? Yeah. Yeah. So how were you interrogated? Describe that. That was uh, that was a nightmare. That was the worst, um, first horrific experience that I had. Uh, just turning 18 years old. Because keep in mind, who doesn't wait to be 18 years old? You're saying liberation, freedom, right? And um, to be 18 years old and to be handcuffed inside a precinct and a detective to ask, what happened? I want to know what you did last night, where'd you go? And when I explained to him, for him to all of a sudden become belligerent with me and call me a liar and tell me that what I was telling him was not the truth, um, I was in shock. I was, I, I didn't know what to understand, what to expect. I'm there thinking, okay, although I'm handcuffed, I'm saying, what's the process here? Is this how they question people or people that they want to help out because I've never been inside a police precinct. Mm. And for me to try to convince him, tell him, why are you calling me a liar? I'm, this is exactly what I did last night. This is what happened. This is what I know. I don't know about anybody being robbed. I don't know about anybody being stabbed or anything. But I went out with my friends and I came back home. I gave the full details. And when he got so violent with me, he just went crazy pulling my hair uh, hitting me, he kicked me, I, I hit my head on the ground, he pulled me from my hair back up into the chair while I was handcuffed. He was blowing cigarette smoke into my face and I was just crying, you know, I was crying like a baby, like a baby. For an 18 year old teenager to think, okay, I'm finally a man, to be crying like a baby once again inside that precinct, um, it was it was horrifying. It was- It had to be. You know? And, and, and this is especially and me being an immigrant, which I didn't consider myself to be an immigrant because I knew I was an immigrant, but being raised at such a young age in the United States, I was already considered, considering myself an American. And although I didn't have my citizenship yet, you know, I was like, I'm an American. I thought like an American. I did everything like an American. And for my parents to raise us, me and my brother, with that say, you respect Authority. What is authority? You respect your bosses, where you work at. You respect your teachers, your principals, the police, everybody that's in authority you respect. And to have somebody in authority come to lay their hands on me, to treat me this way, like it was, a, it was like the person that got stabbed in the subway that night, I felt that I was stabbed in the precinct that night. Did they ever Miranda you? Did they tell you you could ask for a lawyer? I asked for a lawyer. You, you're you the one that brought it up. They, they didn't. No. They and what, and what was their response? That detective that beat me up in the room, okay, when I asked him for a lawyer, he said, if your lawyer was here, he would tell you to do the same thing that I'm telling you to do. Because it got to the point that he told me, if you ever want to make it home, okay, 
will drive you back home, will take you back home, but you have to memorize the story. And throughout that whole process, when he was beating me up, he says, if you don't, one of few things could happen. Somebody could find you in an alley out there in the street dead. You could be in prison for the rest of your life, but you're not making out of here until you do this confession. Because who's going to believe you? You or us? We're the police here. We're in charge. We have the authority. And I was believing every little single thing that he was saying because growing up, you watch movies, you watch TV, and you see these things about what police can do. I was believing everything like what he was saying. I was picturing in my mind. I don't want to end up in an alley. I don't want to end up in prison. You know, what do I have to do or say to help him out, to make him happy, to please him so he can take me back home? Because that's exactly what he was promising. Right. Wow. So... What did I do? I memorized that statement that he wanted me to memorize. And did he come up with the statement? Yes. He came up with it? Yeah. He had the story written, he had the story memorized, what, what? Well, he, I didn't know at that time, but he also already had interrogated some of the other individuals that actually did commit the crime. So he already had familiarized himself and who did what. And he just wanted me to basically state that I knew that there was a crime taking place, that I knew that somebody had a weapon, and that I knew that people needed money to go to Roseland. And by me admitting to these things, that's basically what he wanted. I mean, there were other different particulars on how he wanted me to say it, and he made me repeat it to him, you know, to make sure that I was saying it right. And eventually, there was another detective that came in and out of the room, which I came to find out later, he was the leading detective throughout this whole entire investigation that was the same detective from the Central Park case. That was that Latin guy? Um, a Detective Gonzalez. Detective Gonzalez, exactly. right, right. Who grossly overreached in the Central Park case and was doing the exact same thing to you. Exactly. So he was in charge of this whole investigation and he knew what this detective was doing to me. Of course, of course he knew. Because he kept interrupting it. So, so from your point of view, correct me if I'm wrong, they're getting you to implicate some other guys. You don't see it as I'm implicating myself. Right. They're just elaborating a little bit, filling in some of the blanks to your story because you weren't down on that yeah. platform. You didn't, no? No. He, the, 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 way he, the way he made it sound to me, he said, listen, by you doing this, Aside by you going home, you're doing it because you're, you're, you're helping us out. You're going to be mentioning all these guys. You're going to be mentioning what took place as if, like, you know, um, you're a, a, a witness that's going to help out, you know, uh, and that's it, you know. Uh, but not a witness to the crime, but a witness to what I'm saying. Right. You're thinking, I'm not the guy who stabbed the kid in the heart, so what do I have to worry about? So. Wow. And I, this is over the course of how long? How, how much time? It was like two hours or so, something. I don't, I don't remember exactly. All I know is that um, it seemed like an eternity in right. there, and I just wanted to get out of there. And um, after I memorized the story, he brought in a whole bunch of other detectives, and that's when all of a sudden they read my Miranda rights for the first time. Um, one of the detectives started writing a statement on his own. He told me, tell me what happened. So the detectives, I want you to repeat this to the people into this other lady that's going to be in another room and I repeated everything that he told me to say and the detective was writing it but he didn't write what I was saying he was writing something else he said sign this I signed that um, and you signed that without reading what he had written right right um, prior to that while he was making me memorize the statement because um, uh, he told me hey I want you to pick a woman here and, you know he said uh, which is one of the women that you bumped into? Because on the way going back up, there was, I think it was one of the girls that we were flirting with. But there was another woman that was trying to come down the escalator and I bumped into her. So he's like, uh, is this any of the women that you bumped into? And I said, no. He brought like the pictures. I said, no. And he says, no, this is the woman that you bumped into. And this is the woman that I want you to tell everybody else is that you bumped into. So when he brought the detectives and anything, I, after signing the statement, he brought the pictures I said, yeah, that was the woman I bumped into. They were happy. They all left. And then he takes me into another room. He said, this is going to be a beautiful woman in there, a nice, pretty lady. And I want you to repeat the same thing to her. But the difference was that they were videotaping it. And they were in the room. 
him and one of his other detectives, they were in the room sitting in the back. And every time they were asking me, the, the woman was asking me questions, I kept on looking towards the detectives who were in back of her. And the, the detective that beat me up, he was like, he was giving me the most intimidating look ever. And when I was giving her the responses, he was like, very, very lightly nodding his head, like, you know, like if I was doing a good job, like. So he was giving, coaching you. Yeah, like giving me the notion, okay, yeah. And and I was really believing, you know what, okay, this is finally going to be over and I'm going to go home. So after that, she asked me one question. She said, at the end of everything, this is there anything else you want to say? And I wanted to tell her, yes. I wanted to tell her that the detectives that are sitting behind you, okay, that one specific detective beat me up and told me to say this to you. But I was scared and I didn't. So she ended the, the interview there. She left. That same detective, he gave me a thumbs up, like, you know, you did a great job. Um, and I thought I was going home. They left. Next thing you know, one detective came, got me, took me outside, and started fingerprinting me. After that, I knew I was never going home. I, Wow. 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 Where were you taken after that? Wow. So back then in 1990, I was taken to Rikers Island, the infamous Rikers Island that held 15,000 people in different facilities of Rikers Island. And it was the most violent times of Rikers Island where people were being cut in the face, stabbed. Every single day there was fights between other inmates or between the correction officers and inmates. And as soon as I got there, you know, um, I was already told, I said, listen, if you want to survive in here, you got to fight. And that's exactly what I did. I fought. Wow. So you were 18 years old. You go from your house to providing some testimony that you think will get them to get off your case to Rikers Island the same night. What was it like walking into Rikers? It was scary. It was dark. It was gloomy. It was obscure. Um, I was scared to death. I was a skinny 140, 150 pound kid. Um, white as I am, nobody would think that I was Colombian. And um, everybody else in there um, had just... They, they had been there numerous times before. Yeah, some hardened dudes. Some hardened dudes. Did anybody come to offer you any sort of protection? Any? No. No? No. The only thing that one guy actually did do is that when um, we came back from court, um, we were arraigned. One of the, uh, one of my attorney, he gave me his business card. So he told me, when you get to where you're going, write to me and explain to me everything that happened. So um, when I was already housed, I met someone and I explained to him, I asked him, I said, do you have like anything to write with? He says, well, you want to write your family? He says, no, um, my lawyer told me that I wanted to, I needed to write him. So the guy had experience and says, no, this is how you got to write um, when you write to your attorney. So he provided me um, paper, pen, and he gave me carbon paper as well. He says, always keep a copy for yourself. And that's what I did. So I, I did exactly what he told me to do. And then I wrote to my attorney, I explained to him. And every single time that I wrote to my attorney throughout the time I was in Rikers Island, I always did it through the carbon copy. And I kept the copy for myself. And um, those letters eventually <laughs> helped out in a big way as well later on. Those letters proved to be invaluable later. Yes, very valuable. And was it the letter itself or the carbon copy that you kept? No, the 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 original I always sent to the attorney was the carbon copy. That made that it I through. Kept. Yeah. That wasn't altered in any way. No. Oh. And how much time did you spend in, in Rikers prior to your trial? Close to two years. Yeah. And there was no parole? There was no... Rikers Island, I went through a couple of houses, um, a lot of search downs. I was beat up. I was jumped by correction officers. 
Um, I fought correction officers. There was this one instance where these two correction officers, um, it was three of them. Two of them were on the gallery and one of them, what they called the bubble, where they had the control center to open up all the cells. And the one in the control center in the bubble kept on opening up every cell one by one from the beginning all the way towards the end. And these two officers were going inside every cell and they just decided to like beat people up out of fun. They just, I don't know what, why or what they were on or what made them do that, but they just decided to go into every single cell. And I was, I don't remember, I think oh, I was in like 10 cells down, mm -hmm. nine cells down. By the time they got up to me, I said, I'm not gonna let them come inside my cell. You know, I don't know what I'm gonna do, but I'm not gonna let them come inside my cell. As soon as they opened up my cell, I got out and they were like, you know, wanted to fight and I just started fighting with them. Mm. I started fighting with uh, two correction officers and to my amazement, I knocked one of them down. And I couldn't believe it. I had knocked one of them down because they were both bigger and taller than me. And the other correction officer, he had like a broomstick or his belly club and he hit me with it behind my back and down I went to the floor. But the other correction officer said, no, leave him alone. And everybody else on the gallery that, that was able to see this, saw this, and they were like, ah! And because of that um, situation that these two correctional officers had with me, they didn't bother going through all the other cells. They just went back. Tell them, no, let them go inside, and they just went back. So that was like one experience that I had that was a very horrifying experience for me. Mm -hmm. Aside from other experiences with other inmates as well, but Rikers Island was a very, very tough, tough place to be in um, while I was there. What did you learn about yourself as a result of it? Well, there was so much that I didn't know and so much that I still needed to learn. Mm -hmm. But at that moment, being transferred, and when I say transferred, being transferred from a life that I was living with my family, a life that I was trying to make for myself to all of a sudden inside of a jail cell and saying, this is the life that I have to live in order to survive, the survival of the fittest. I didn't want to be in that environment. I didn't want to live like that. I didn't want to look behind my back, waking up every single day. Not that I have to fight somebody and there's people in there that are bigger than me. I had no weapons. I had no ways of, of getting what they got. I was using my bare hands, my bare fist. And like I said, if I'm skinny now or if, or if I'm any size of how you want to look at me, when I literally say 150 or 140, I was this skinny back then. I, don't, I didn't know how I was surviving, but I did realize um, a few years later, especially after I went upstate, that that wasn't the solution. That wasn't the route to take because I saw many people that thought that by fighting and being violent that they were gaining their respect and reputation. All of that came back to them. They made so many enemies and those enemies came to attack them. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know what? At the same time, I don't want to be like them. This is not who my parents raised me to be. So I... Uh, so what approach did you take? What, what, what? I, I took all that anger and bitterness that I had and that whole prison-minded mentality and said, you know what? I'm just going to be me. I'm just going to be Johnny. I'm just going to be the person that my parents said that I am, that I always have been. And I'm just going to stay focused. I'm now I'm going to focus on my freedom, my innocence. I'm going to go to school, I'm going to go to college, I'm going to get my education. And that's what I did. I became a loner. And don't get me wrong, I had many, many confrontations while I was in prison. Um, there were so many of them with, because my case had so much notoriety that it didn't make a difference what facilities I went to. I always had correction officers threatening me. I had correction officers... Um, plant 
a big, what they call in prison, a shank, this mm -hmm. big, on me. I went to say hello to somebody and he just threw it in front of me. I had correction officers come to my cell and look at me, two, three of them with a sergeant. And I said, excuse me, how can I help you? And they didn't say anything. They just kept on looking at me in silence. And that scared me. Mm -hmm. To one of them saying, you're in our house. And I'm like, you know, what surprises me so much about your story, Johnny, is that you you ultimately served, what, 25 years? 25 years. 25 years. And as long as I've known you, and in full disclosure, we, we know each other off camera, um, I've never known you to be bitter. I've never known you to carry any resentment in your heart. Um, I'm not sure I'm, 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 well, I'm sure that I'm not that big of a man. I'm, I, I'm sure that I would carry a tremendous amount of resentment. At what point did you decide to let that let that bitterness go? Because I'm sure there had to be some bitterness in your heart at some point. No, um, three, four years down the line, when I was already upstate, like I was mentioning to you, when I saw so many people being stabbed and it, some individuals being even killed, um, I said, this this whole emotional and mental process is not doing anything for me at all. The, the, this route that I was taught to take by trying to survive through violence, through fighting, is not gonna work. And it's not allowing me to focus. It's not allowing me to think. That takes a tremendous amount of self-awareness. It really does. It's, it's absolutely remarkable. Did, did, did your faith play into this at all? Did faith in, in, in God or whatever religion you, did that play a role in it at well, all or no? I'll tell you this, Tony. Um, I have a beautiful family. I think everybody will, that has a family and loves their family will say the same thing that I'm saying. We love our family. And I love my family so much and I give them so much credit because they were always there by my side. They gave me so much support and love while I was in prison. And I think to see the difference of the individuals that be turn, that turned into animals. Mm -hmm. When I say animals are prison animal, not literal animal mm -hmm. but that animal that someone can change from being a human being into thinking that you just resolve everything through violence he becomes an animal in prison he doesn't care about anything at all and to see that and then to compare the love of my family is to answer your question about why i decided to take this bitterness and anger and just to put it behind me because i, I like i mentioned i remembered who my parents raised me to be, who I was. And I said, I can't live like this. It's, it's not healthy. It's not helping me at all. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the fact that I saw my family suffering at the same time, that, that, that clamor of love is what really made me think, you know what? Um, I, I really, really got to just be myself. And, you know, God definitely had a, a major role to play in this. Any individual, I don't care if you're an atheist, an agnostic, a Muslim, a Christian, Catholic, Jew, whatever you believe in. When you're in prison, the moment you get in there, I guarantee you, you're going to believe in God. You'll find God. You're going to find God one way or another. And if you decide not to believe in God afterwards, that's your decision. But you're going to find God. And I found God in prison. I found God in prison. Because I couldn't, I couldn't look for anybody else. When I was locked inside my cell and I was left there till the next morning, the night, and the lights were turned off, I had no one else to turn to but God. My mother wasn't there. My father wasn't there. My attorney wasn't there. My girlfriend wasn't there. But God was there. So I, 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 I cried every night. I prayed every night. And every morning I used to wake up, no matter how much faith I had in God. Let me tell you something. When people hear my story, when people as many times as they interview me, says, you know, I give you a lot of credit. You're, you're so strong. You, you, you leaned on God to provide you with that strength. 
to make it throughout all those years. But every single morning I woke up turning and I asked myself, was this going to be the day that I was going to take my life? Was this going to be the day that I was going to kill myself? When was it going to end? Mm -hmm. I did that every single day. And one night, I got down on my knees and I prayed to God and I said, God, I don't want to live anymore. I really, like right now, I know I ask myself all the time, when is it going to happen? But right now, I want it to happen. Right now. I don't want to go through another day. All of my appeals were denied. I had it like about 15 years in prison at the time. Um, I couldn't take it anymore. Bottom line, I couldn't take it anymore. I didn't have that will. I didn't have that strength. And I just said, you know what? I don't have the guts to take my own life. But I'm asking you, when I go to sleep tonight, just let me die in my sleep. Let me wake up in heaven. And when I woke up the next morning and I saw those prison bars in front of me, I was so upset and I was so mad at God. I said, why? Why did you keep me alive? And I couldn't understand why. I didn't know why. But I did find out why later on. And from that moment after that prayer, Tony, my case turned into a 180 degree. There was a 180 turnaround in my case. Everything went so perfect in proving my innocence. After that night. Huh. Wow. And how did you get involved with uh, Kubi? So, Ronald Kuby, by the way, who happens to be a very, very well-known attorney, a bit of a celebrity attorney uh, for his remarkable work. <clears throat> uh, man, that really needs no introduction from me. But how, how did you... So, Ron Kuby, uh, prior to having him represent me, I thought the same thing what you just mentioned. And I still do. In my eyes, he's probably one of five of the best attorneys throughout the whole of the United States. He can, many people can even say he is the Perry Mason of the 21st century. That is how good of a criminal attorney Ron Kuby is. And there's not enough words of gratitude that I have to, to, to mention how this man fought for me in court. What he did for me was the first time ever out of all the attorneys that I've ever had that I saw him fight with his whole heart. Like he believed in me so much. He's like if I was his own son. Total conviction. You know? Yeah. And that brought tears to my eyes because I couldn't believe it. That was like, I never had that. Right. When you're 25 years in prison and you never have the representation that you need and to have this man here do that for you it was it was it was a, it was a dream come true and what was the what was the key to his representation what was the thing so, that made your exoneration so possible so i was in a theater program uh in prison after i graduated from college and um and i met this woman her name was kim breeden and she was like the angel sent from God that started this whole movement. And she, I was casted as Tony for West Side Story. And she was my vocal coach. And she said, you know, I notice everybody in here, I interact with everybody, but you're different. You don't seem to belong in here. Why are you here? I said, we could leave that for another day. Just, just focus on what we're supposed to be doing. And eventually um, I told her my story and on her own, without telling me anything, she went and spoke to some police officer that she was dating. And the police officer said, I know who this guy needs. Uh, this sounds like the type of work that Bill Hughes can handle. And Bill Hughes was a journalist, reporter, working for the Journal News at the time in Westchester County, who... Um, Forte at the time was exposing corrupted 
police officers, detectives, DAs, and judges. So Bill Hughes eventually came to see me, took an interest in my case, and he started researching and investigating my case. And in the beginning, I had no evidence to prove to him that I was innocent other than what I was saying that occurred and happened to me. And he just started reading a lot of my um, trial minutes and a lot of my paperwork and everything. And on his own, he started to discover a lot of things that all of a sudden made sense to what I was telling him. Mm -hmm. Started to see a lot of loopholes. And all the, the things that the DA's office had said against me weren't that in light to be true after all. Mm -hmm. So he wrote a, 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 an article about me that was printed in a magazine. And in that article, it was all over the New York. And one day, there was the ex-commissioner of the New York State Parole came to visit um, my graduate class in Sing Sing. And um, everybody in my class, all of a sudden, was asked to speak about them and their crime. And when I got to myself, I spoke about myself. And this guy knew exactly about the Utah tourist case. He was very well aware. He, says, he specifically said, I remember that case. Well, I never saw him after that. But he read that article that this guy printed. And he decided to call up Bill Hughes and to kind of like join forces with him and to want to look into my case. Now, keep in mind, Bill Hughes is just a reporter. He's never been an investigator. And Bob Dennison, who was the ex-commissioner of parole, he was a commissioner of parole. He'd never been an, ex an investigator, so this was fairly new to them. Mm -hmm. And between the both of them, they just went out looking for evidence. What did they find? They found the letters that I totally forgot about that I had written when I first went into Rikers Island, which were All those years earlier. All those years later. Um, they found witnesses. There was a woman in the subway station that knew me from the neighborhood. We didn't hang out. We weren't the best of friends. I didn't even knew her. I didn't know her name. But, but she, she recognized she you. Knew, she knew me. And she knew a bunch of the other guys as well from the neighborhood right. in Flushing. And she was in the subway she's waiting for her friend to come in the subway because they too were going to Roseland. So... She said that her and her friend, every time they met, they always met like towards the end mm -hmm. of the station. So she was there. And where did the crime take place? In front of her. So she saw the whole entire thing. So she knew that you weren't there. She didn't see me at all. She right. says, I saw everything that happened. I saw who did what. I remember um, what had, happened. Had she testified in court? Or no? So this is what happened. When she saw... Um, this on the news, she told her mother, said, listen, um, this guy, Johnny, he's being arrested and he, he had nothing to do with this. I was there. She told, she's saying this to her mother and her mother's telling her, said, listen, don't get involved. You have a newborn baby. If he's innocent, eventually, okay, that'll come out to light and nothing will happen to him. So she didn't go to the police or anything. Wow. Now. She didn't know what happened to And me. how did she come forward all these years later? Well, she's, she, um, she said that she was working in a hospital. Right? I don't know if she was a nurse or something. I don't remember what her title of employment was. But one day, she was going through her break, and she decided to read the newspaper. And in the New York Post, there was an article about me. My case had been reopened again. I, I was having an actual innocence hearing, and she saw me. And she said, hold on a second. And she started reading, and the whole thing says... This is Johnny. I, and, and to herself, she said, I didn't know that he was still incarcerated all these years. So that's when all of a sudden she decides to came wow. forward. Now, there were other witnesses, too. But she was like... She was the key. She was the key. She was yeah. the key. Yeah. How about the other two girls that you guys were flirting with on a train station? So one of those girls, right, she came forward the very next day called... Uh, what is it, Crime Stoppers or 1 800, uh, whatever right, it was, right, one of those things, to, yeah. to say that she witnessed the guys coming out the train station. But she also said there were two guys flirting with her. So she corroborated to the two guys flirting with her. The other guy that I was with flirting towards the girls, he always told his attorney, he said, Listen, 
I was flirting with these girls. So his attorney was, I, I give him so much credit. He was relentless to the DA's office to, you know, listen, you need to find out who these girls were. But the DA never mentioned anything about these girls until 18 months later. And nobody mentioned it to your attorneys? No. So this is the whole thing. The girls mentioned two guys. My friend was only mentioning about him. His attorney never asked them, hey, who else was with you or anything like that. The DA knew there was somebody else, but nobody knew who was this other guy. So this other guy came to testify. And when he came to testify, he told him straight up, says, Nobody asked me. And that other guy, who was that other guy that was sitting with me, flirting with these girls? It was Johnny. Wow. And how is that so true? Because one of the guys that confessed to the crime, that actually participated in this crime, he confessed and gave specific details of what took place. And they asked him, well, how many guys committed the crime with you? He said, six. The DA was trying to make him say eight through a series of multiple questions i believe it was like more than six times the da was trying to impose my name in his confession says but johnny and kevin were with you and he kept telling says no johnny and kevin left it was six of us not eight of us it was six and the da kept on trying to say but johnny says i just kept, i just told you johnny wasn't there so this is on camera but again when Bill Hughes, Bob Dennison, and Ron Kuby, now that they see what the DA was covering with the corroboration of the girl saying there was two guys flirting with her, the guy who never mentioned by name, the letters, the girl that happened to be in the subway. I mean, now everything is clear. Johnny wasn't there. I wasn't there. So all this evidence, the judge decided to throw my case out. Wow. How did you get word that you were going free? I didn't, I didn't get word. What happened was after I had uh, gone through my whole hearing, which was like, like going to trial again, because here you are fighting for your life, proving your innocence. I had to take the stand, which I never got to take in the first place when I went to trial, because I had asked my attorney and he wouldn't let me. So now I take the stand and I'm, we're waiting for the judge's decision. We waited, we waited like, I think, like three or four months for his decision. So um, by that time, I'm, I'm in Fishkill Correctional Facility. And they bring me down to court. And I'm in court. The courtroom was jam-packed. Were your parents in the courtroom? My parents were in court. My brother, my niece, family, friends. There was nobody else in that court but for me. The DAs were there, the press was there, but everybody else was there for me. And the judge said he was going to release me. He said, I'm, I'm, I'm throwing this case out. Now, because I wasn't a citizen and I had been in the United States as a resident, um, I had a deportation order because by law, Immigration law states that anyone in this country that is convicted of a felony, a felony crime gets mandated with a deportation order. Mm. So the district attorney's office brought that to the judge's attention. The judge was like, well, I never had a situation where somebody that I want to release has an immigration order. And by law, you can't release somebody with a, a deportation order. So the district attorney wanted to send me back to my facility because he knew that if that happened, immigration was going to pick me up. And because they're two totally different jurisdictions, even though the judge had just finished throwing my case out, immigration still has to fulfill their responsibility of deporting me. Right. So, wow, how absurd. Yeah. So, so my attorney, Ron Kuby, says, Your Honor, well, why don't you give him a dollar bail, okay, so he can... Um, try to solve this whole immigration situation because by law you can give him bail. So the DA said, you know what, that's a great idea. Give him the dollar bail. They didn't think I was going to get the dollar bail. They didn't think that, you know, it was going to be that quick. What they didn't know was that I already had an immigration attorney in place 
that took the judge's decision of throwing my case out mm -hmm. and took it to an immigration judge that showed him that by law now, the reason why you gave him a deportation was because you had convicted him. Now he doesn't have a conviction. Okay. So by law, you have to throw that deportation order out as well. So he nullified it immediately. My immigration judge took that order, brought it back to court. So when I was being released, when I walked out on court, the press, the media, everybody thought that I was being released on a dollar bail. But in reality, I didn't have a dollar bail on me. I was released, period. Oh, good. It was yeah. just a, uh, a formality, basically. Exactly. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So, Johnny, you were, you were little, literally released from one day to the next after having spent the majority of your life in prison. What was it like suddenly finding your freedom again? That must have been just overwhelming. Well, having um, the heart of a teenager in 1990, being taken away from my home and f seeing my mother crying, you know, at the end of the day, she's my mother and I'm her son. And regardless of how many people were out Side the court building, the first person to be there to receive me in open arms was my mother. I was in tears. I felt like a little baby again, you know, a little kid. And my mother was in tears. Uh, but it was the most beautiful moment that I had ever received um, out of anything that I ever wished for in my life. I mean, regardless of growing up as a kid, as everything that I ever wanted to accomplish, everything that I ever wanted to do in life, that was the biggest choice happiest moment I ever had and and to have it with my mother even made it better and what surprised you because a lot of things had changed from 1990 you fast forward 25 years later there are a lot of technological advances neighborhoods don't look the same anymore fashion is what it used to be what sort of surprised you well um I think in New York City it had changed so much that you go from a place where crime was at its all time high to find, you know, such beautiful new buildings, such beautiful new restaurants and a place where people were so welcoming. There was so much hospitality. So my, the amiability was amazing. You know, back then you ask somebody a question it was like, they mind their business. They didn't want to help you. They didn't want to answer you. Now, I, education is key. Um, everybody has a different lively personality. Kids today, kids nowadays, are way so much smarter and intelligent than kids that I knew that I was growing up with. And, you know, again, technology had a lot to do with that. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. We'll wait for her to disappear. And at um, was there anybody looking back over the years that you were away? Was there a person or people that stick out in your mind for having been particularly kind or good to you? Inside? Yeah. You know what it is, is that it's it's an environment where you can't really trust people and you go through so many bad experiences. And um, there was one individual that I met that when we first started talking to each other and learning about each other, kind of realized, you know, we weren't too different. Really were two good people. We had great conversations. He was a, a humble individual. He believed in God just like I believed in God. But we really couldn't consider ourselves friends. And it took us 15 years from being in different facilities and meeting up with each other different times when we realized, you know, we were just not friends, but we're brothers now. Because it was that level of trust that we knew that I wasn't going to backstab him. He wasn't going to backstab him. We weren't going to do each other wrong at all, like how people had done us wrong all the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was people in prison that were nice, but 
they didn't treat you the way that you would expect to be treated out here through some of your friends. You know, there's not, you don't, you don't grow up with friends out here and say, you know, I'm going to do you wrong. Um, this was the type of person that um, he always wished the best for mm -hmm. me. And I always wished the best for him. Uh, I remember when my case was reopened inside a prison. I mean, you had individuals that approached me and said, you know, I'm so happy for you, Johnny. You know, you, you deserve this, man. You, you went through so much in prison and, and, and I always knew you were innocent. I wish you the best. And you had a lot of individuals that supposedly were my friends that worked with me, that taught classes with me or that I played sports with. Right. I'm their best buddies when I'm shooting a three pointer. I'm their best buddies when I'm uh, kicking a goal or, or, or when I'm supporting them in the classroom or on on stage. But all of a sudden they don't even, they can't even come up to me and say, you know, I'm happy that, you know, this is happening for you because you're revealing your innocence. And I understand to a degree that although they're guilty, you know, they wish that they were receiving their freedom as well. But it's it's that that jealousy or whatever it is that's going inside of them of hate that they can't understand is not allowing them to want to come and support me. And this individual, his name is Georgie, by the way, um, he, he, was, he was just a genuine person. He was a real person. And he also... Uh, was innocent in prison. Mm. The difference between him and I is that he did 33 years in prison. 33 years in prison, and he never got to prove his innocence. And I'm, and back then, I was helping him. I was writing letters to law firms and to different institutions, trying to get somebody to help him take his case. And since he's been released, I've been trying to do the same thing. But this person here, yeah, I consider him my brother. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I understand your 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 situation practically bankrupted your parents that the the amount of money that they spent on what in hindsight was inadequate defense led them to lose their business led them to some real tragic financial difficulties talk to me a little bit about that well my parents came to this country um, like any other immigrant family, working hard to make a living, make a life. And for a Colombian immigrant family to live in Bay Terrace, Queens at the time in a two-family home was a big deal, quite a big deal of success and of achievement for, for two parents that never finished college. And to have all of their life savings taken from them by my attorneys, attorneys that saw um, a door, that saw an opportunity to just take advantage. Um, whatever my father, my, from the age of 18 coming to this country to he was 50 something at the time, and my mother working so hard to all of a sudden move into a one bedroom apartment was hard for them and keep in mind they kept coming to visit me throughout the whole 25 years traveling wherever I was to bring me food to bring me socks to bring me underwears to bring me an extra sweater or from my birthday they wanted to bring me a little pie or something because couldn't bring a cake with candles and all that money that was taken from them and all the money they spent, um, they never recovered it. So it, 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 it was a major deal for them. But at the end of the day, you know, my parents and I, um, we thank God that they're alive and that I'm alive. Because again, I told you, I didn't know if I was gonna make it alive. Sure, and, and it was that love that saw you through it all. Yeah. It was that family bond. It was that, 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 that cariño, as we call it, that made you come out the other side. And my parents, don't get me wrong, they were, you know, my father's 80 years old right now. And my mother's six, she's going to be 68. So there were many times that they used to come and visit me and says, you know, Johnny, we're staying alive because of you. 
and they have to walk out through one door and I have to go back inside through another door. When I went inside through that door, all the tears came down my face from hearing them say that to me. You know, you know how many people I met in prison whose parents died and they had it to go to the funeral and bury their parents? This is what I mean that I wish I never went through what I went through and, and what I wish my parents didn't have to go through this either. And I wish our financial situation was different, that the attorneys didn't take what they took from my parents. But to have us together again, healthy, sound minded and physically here. And whenever we die, we're going to die now together, you know, not while I was in there, not separated from each other. That is a huge difference, a major difference. And um, listen, there's a lot of individuals, like, like I told you, that never got to see their parents when they came home. And there's a lot of individuals like Georgie that never got to prove their innocence. I didn't give up. I wanted to give up, but I didn't give up. And I'm glad I didn't give up. And I'm glad I made it through. And I'm glad that at the end of the day, my innocence was proven. Well, we're all glad you made it through, pal. Before I close, I have one other question for you. And it relates to um, something you said a little bit ago. Uh, and you use the term revealed my innocence. How important was it for you, not just to regain your freedom, but to reveal your innocence? It meant everything. It meant everything because for you to be in prison for something that you didn't do, um, to have your whole life taken away from you, and to have an image of being a, a felon, a convict, an inmate, a prisoner for a crime you never committed, and you're telling everyone around you that you didn't do this, you didn't, you had no knowledge, and 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 you and just just asking for help. And years go by, and nobody wanted to help me because I didn't have the financial resources or I didn't have the actual evidence. Is is a big deal, and and not to mention, all of my parents' friends turned their back on them. Said, oh, you, you have a son that's in prison. Well, we can't socialize with you. We can't be seen with you. We can't be friends with you. And then when I come home, all of a sudden, these absentee friends come back to life and says, oh, we always believed in you. You know, I don't care how people want to phrase it or how they want to pretend like they were always there. So many people weren't there. But proving your innocence is... It's like proving to someone that was negated as a child by all of a sudden having DNA showing that he is your bloodline, you know, and then you can say he is my son or he is my father. And that means so much because people don't be didn't believe that you were related and and for someone to actually see that the injustices that occur in this country are so real, but they negate these injustices because it doesn't happen to them until they see someone like me come on and says, this is real. My innocence is real. My innocence meant everything to me. And I'm telling you, the United States of America, I'm telling you, Colombia, I'm telling the world, okay, that I could. I needed, okay, to have everybody understand that I spent 25 years in prison for something that I didn't do. And to now finally have that proven gives my life back. The life that was taken away from me. You ask yourself, what is your life about? and what it's worth, and what does it mean. And you'll understand what I'm talking about revealing my innocence. Thank you so much, Johnny. Thank you, Tony. I appreciate it. Thank you.